Alrighty, hey guys, welcome back to another video. And today we continue the thread overlook video uh, that has to do with war and peace and diplomacy in general. So uh, we've done three parts before this and uh, part one, we went over uh, this post right here from the developers and we went over the first page and there's a lot of information here uh, pretty much before 1.5.1 and after 1.5.1 and the changes and how they affect the game. And uh, there's been a lot, a lot of information in this thread. So I've been ju just going over it pretty much every single day, just a couple pages a day and uh, getting through it. You guys enjoy it. So I'm gonna keep it going for you guys and uh, we're gonna go from there. But uh, we're on page five now. I'm gonna link this down below as well if you wanna just read all of it through for yourself. But if you wanna just listen to me talk about it you know, over like this long period of time, it's uh, about 20 to 25 minutes. In, uh, an episode then yeah let's get right to it so we ended off let's see where we ended off real quick so at the end of page four what was being said so so Des was talking about peace and barter and all of that and this guy was helping a lot as well he was providing some very very good um, info and uh, he keeps doing it and we're gonna see him keep doing it all right so let's uh let's get to it so we're going to try to skip a, like a couple of these posts and and if I do skip something important my apologies but um I want to kind of you know what I mean speed the process up because we have a lot of pages to go through you know so uh um let's read this one yes I, I've checked that info nice one thanks and it's nice to see how the AI tries to fight uh, just one war but there are still some war slash peace declarations which do not make much sense to me uh, do not make me wrong, the new data looks pr uh, pretty promising and I'm really happy with this, but I think that some tweaks are still necessary. 30 day wars are still a low number for those main wars and plus 50 looks like a much better thing. 75 to 100 days would be great in my opinion. So he's talking about the, um, the average war times. Right now they're very low at about 25 for the average war time. The devs have said they want to make it above 50. Uh, plus making war and peace declaration, especially wars, uh, less likely to happen is something easy to do and could help a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, looking forward to seeing these last uh, last weeks you're doing. Really thanks for taking care of this issue. Yeah, he's been doing a really good job. So uh, this guy, he's been finding all the good information. So let's see what he has to say. So I definitely agree with longer wars. I'd like to uh, see more wars like the... Uh, the Batanians versus Kazate 77 day fight about one year because I'm pretty sure one in game year is how much is that? Is that 84 days? 84 or 86 in game uh, days is one year in the game or is it 82? It's one of those. Uh, like I mentioned in one of my bullet points, the stronger the kingdoms seem to stay in war much longer. So, stronger kingdoms stay in war much longer. Okay. I think something that could help with balance is if a strong is if the stronger a kingdom gets, the the more wars they are willing to fight until they are weakened. Ooh. Ooh, okay. So so let's say... That makes sense. That makes sense. So let's say... Um, yeah. I, I, I think that... Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point to be brought up. So let's say the Kazates have half the map, right? So in terms of everyone else on the map, they're going to be pretty small, right? So they should be able to fight one or two wars at a time, right? At most, right? Two at most. But the Kazates, since they own like half the map, they should, you know, their, their, their amount of wars should bump up to like three or four. So, you know, obviously you own more land, so you're going to be pretty much fighting more people for it. I think that makes sense. I think that does make sense. I, I would actually agree with that, yeah. When making peace with the strong faction, the weak faction would take into account how many wars the enemy is in and consider the overall power of people attacking the enemy and either require tribute from the strong or not accept peace. So strong factions have on average two to four wars while weak factions have on average one to two wars. I agree with this. I think that should actually be a thing. It's going to balance it because here's how it's going to balance it. So if one of the AI kingdoms, obviously the Kazates, or let's say the Southern Empire, for example, because they've been pretty strong in my playthroughs. Let's say they do take over half the map. Then um, they are going to get ganged up on by the smaller kingdoms, kind of like teamed up on. And um, hopefully they will grow down in size and kind of even the uh, playing field again. And uh, yeah, I think that will make it for very uh, better gameplay. And in terms of just like kind of like, you know what I mean? Kingdoms are going to be able to build back. 
and not just get destroyed once they do become small because that still is a problem they have made some changes in 1.5.1 where kingdoms will still make armies regardless of their size but at the same time it's still very hard to come back so uh come back to like a reasonable amount because they can't come back now to like owning a couple settlements but they can't really come back to the point where they go from the worst to the best and i think once we get to that point i think the game is going to be in a very very good state uh for example the data shows that because were the strongest and only ever had war declared on them three times because they were so strong so basically once the kingdom becomes the clear strongest no one wants to contest them they uh also only had to pay tribute once out of all their wars so they've been making a lot of money uh bullying everyone and never getting weaker they should either be getting zerged by the weaker kingdoms or paying out massive tributes to weaker kingdoms to not gang up on them agree 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 very good um very good ob observation and very good um what's it called points i agree with these a lot so for people interested i made a same test for the current 1.5 version and noted all war and peace declarations so we did talk about this in part one uh, if we go over here this was pretty much added over here so we did talk about it if you guys want to check this out we did um talk about that in part one so we are going to skip this you just talk about how the wars have happened and then kind of like how the map looks so that is in part one if you guys want to go check that out so again see this guy's really helping out really cool to see um so interesting this definitely proves your changes have improved uh kingdom survivability which is much needed one five does seem to have our desired longer wars i'll be back much later with some concrete uh data comparing 1.5 to 1.51 here's a graph comparing active wars we can see that that there is half the amount of worldwide wars in 1.5.1 bringing the kingdom average down from two to one okay yeah so it's pretty much halved almost all of these right and this one's kind of close but half or even less this guy barely gets into wars okay um what else we got good changes dun, dun, dun. this guy also this guy has also been on the forums for a while and he has been very uh, productive so i am going to read what he has to say as well so yes two so this is the developer yes two different making peace options is currently a problem maybe we should remove making peace from barter by paying 100 200 300k of money that's why we still have 20 day truce after war declaration is seen in the code maybe set a barter in a large lump of some gold to the enemy in exchange for a truce you can offer a certain amount of daily tribute just set the auto balance point of the barter to whatever tribute value makes the score for peace become positive the two could even be combined the player put, uh, pays a sum of gold up front as a penalty for circumventing the voting process and the tribute value is also offered to prevent another war in the near term uh you might all you might still get cases where you offer more tribute than your own faction finds acceptable and war is immediately declared again to renegotiate the uh the tribute amount though using tribute as a barterable uh opens up the door for all sorts of neat gameplay options for instance a lord can loan you a sum of money in exchange for a certain amount of daily tribute uh repaid over time that represents a loan interest yes 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 yes, yes. that's very cool very cool or if a non-aggression pact becomes a mechanic tribute can be part of the negotiation yes yeah, so the whole non-aggression kingdoms we have talked about this if you if you um if they were to implement this into the game where you can be pretty much neutral and non-aggressive and not participate in wars obviously historically speaking um countries and kingdoms and all that, that did participate in this they all had a lot of financial ties to everybody involved or everyone around them if that kind of makes sense right so you can't just be neutral and non-aggressive and thinking oh they're not going to do any wars with me because i chose this option no you pretty much have to you know what i mean make it financially viable for the person not to go to war with you if that kind of makes sense right and that doesn't always mean just paying them sometimes you guys can be in a deal for um stuff right so um i think i, I enjoy this too like to make the whole bartering thing where you can actually pay a lump sum up front just to lower the tribute payments and stuff of that nature kind of make it more uh, transformative I do agree with this. Uh, so the code part of the post, I don't know whether it's our code business or currently still in, but I always regarded the loss of men for sneaking in or out of siege way too high. I faced loss of 20, 30% and sometimes, so never used it in the first trial. In the end, I installed a mod to remove the loss feature entirely. I find the whole mechanic not very realistic. Could the loss rate be toned down? Um, I agree. 
Yeah, I agree. I thought I, I never. I usually never break into towns for that specific reason because guess what? There's a chance that they might take out twenty to thirty percent of your best troops, and so I never do it. So I think this should be a tweak. But uh, let's see. So two thousand nine. The number of percentage of troops you sacrifice is partially based on your tactic skill. The higher the skill level, the fewer troops that are sacrificed. If a number of troops are sacrificed, is acceptable. Uh, if the number of troops that it, that are sacrificed is acceptable, even with high tactics, then uh, that reduced the incentive of developing the tactic skill because the reward is less meaningful. You're getting a large advantage for breaking in to a besiege settlement. The fortification walls are a force multiplier. The question you should ask yourself in this situation, will I lose troops by breaking into the settlement and defending what's inside? Okay, so here's the thing. I understand what he's talking about, but here's the thing. So, I understand that sieges have been, been changed, so even if you do break in now, the um, AI will technically not leave the siege and still continue to fight but what's very frustrating is when you do pick this feature and um as soon as you get into the castle the enemy just decides to up oh, let's get up let's pack up our bags and leave and um i don't know how exactly you would fix this because obviously i want the ai to have a choice if they can leave or not right but um i don't know i think that uh, it's a very tricky it's a very tricky question right because I, I stopped forcing my way into castles and towns because of that specific reason where I did it. And as soon as I did it, boom, the army just left. You know what I mean? And that was very, very, very frustrating because I just lost 20, 30% of my troops. Sometimes they were very, very good troops. And uh, the army is still a big problem. And they can still come back again to that same thing once I leave. And um, now I'm down 20, 30% troops. So I don't know. It's a very, I, I don't really have an answer for it. Tricky slope, right? Uh, when we make a peace with a strong faction, the weaker faction would take into account how many wars. Okay. As I was said, there's already a top dog score which factors into who is at war and the strongest faction in the world at the time. If a faction is at war with, with the top dog, then the likelihood of getting to another war is lowered. Okay. There's also called benefit score. Okay. The benefit score calculates how the beneficial the war is. Okay. But I still do agree with this, that, that if you are a stronger faction, you should um, participate in more wars. I think that makes sense overall. Because you have more land, you have more clans, therefore you can, you know, fight more wars. Uh, what else do we got? So we got a little graph over here. So this kingdom, count of attackers, count of defenders. Okay. Uh, what else do we got? Let's read this. Uh, so looking at the war declaration data from his 1.5.1 test, they did not seem to be having a major impact. You can see the graphs I posted because H were, was only declared war on three times compared to the average of 16 for the others. Table of defenders attackers counts below. I'm looking for the case to, to be getting war uh, declared and, and either having a bunch of wars going or having to pay the weaker factions, thus making case to be poorer slash weaker. There are two periods of time that Kazates had more than two wars going on, and the longest, be, the longest latest uh, between winter 13, 1089 and spring 16, 1090. Uh, 24 days and not enough to have an impact on the kingdom looking at the end of 1090. Okay, they reached up to five wars during the period, but only two days, and it went back down to three. This is actually probably a sign that it was working, but they need to keep wars uh, low. Okay, low overrode it's. Uh, by the way, Kazates came out on top four or five of these wars receiving tribute. Okay. Uh, what am I looking at? So, kingdom, count of attackers, count of defenders. Okay. Uh, what else do we got over here? Got more conversation. Let's go to the next table and let's see. Next table, next page. Uh, do you have any dev replies? Here we go. Let's get a dev reply in here. So finally, this never-ending war was actually end. I love you, Mexico. Thank you so much. There it is. Thanks for the feedback. It becomes great if different players have their feedback to screenshots like this. Also, it becomes great if you leave screenshots from map 2. And uh, it becomes good if you can write what you feel about tribute payments, low, high, or ideal for your situation. My concern, my concern now is wars can usually end in short periods of time. This can also not be good for gameplay, but I'm aware of it, and I will try to make it longer for future adjustments. Oh, man, this guy went in. Right, let's read this. 
on the shower, I was thinking, just like I did in my research, I forgot to remove my brother from the equation. I forgot that not all nobles are actually party leaders. I revised my table. So what is the table is this? Other fun facts. Sergey has two party leaders without any tactics or leadership skill whatsoever. See below. Huh. Okay. So what is this? So we got the faction, pot uh, potential, total faction, tactic, comp uh, capability. Uh, okay. Okay, hold on. So, okay, so by, by this list, so my conclusion here, Storga is underpowered compared to the two of the neighbors that are missing cavalry and has already has an auto calc advantage. Considering that the two of Storga nobles have no tactic leadership skill at all is sad and hilarious. Okay, so you can see a zero for this. And kind of lower overall okay achievement for you uh first player gets eight thousand hold on first player gets eight thousand tribute payment from any kingdom and put and place here a screenshot wins three achievements b is hard c is medium your faction will get eight thousand tribute if you are a vassal in the kingdom get eight thousand tribute as a king five thousand tribute payment for any kingdom while you are sturgeon vassal oh someone gets an achievement if they do it cool um is this this guy's sharing his thing i'm getting 361 dinars daily as tribute and i think it seems ideal but i don't know how i would feel when i'll be the one to pay tribute does everyone pay equal would it be hard to pay as a new vassal things like the number of fees to clan tier distribute the tribute payments okay let me take the achievement a sir there it is you did number a You got achievement A about your question. Did you actually receive something or no? <laughs> about your question, tribute is paid and recently. Wait, tribute is paid and received by mostly fief owning ratio among kingdom clans. Towns are counted uh, two and castles are counted one. Default, every clan can get one even when they have no settlement. King clan gets two, gets an extra two, then tribute is paid and received proportionally by total value you have. Okay, so that's pretty much how tribute is paid. So the more you own, the more you will be. Um, contributing to the tribute the king obviously contributes kind of the most because he gets an extra two and if you have nothing you still have to contribute because you will get one for having nothing okay makes sense um so this guy said thank you nicely designed system i wouldn't think of a better way um players can somehow manage their economy while paying for tribute but i think some lords might go broke as I see some of them wander with several thousands of dinars in their pockets, their economy management might not might need some work too. Okay, so only clan leaders carry money. Uh, others have at most 5 to 10k, and if their money is higher than 5k, they pay the difference to the clan leader at the end of the day. About going bankrupt, yes, you are right, this can happen. If a kingdom has less fiefs, and if they need to pay high tributes, they can. this can happen sometimes. But it is like real life. Uh, it's good for game. It's good for a game that you can weaken your enemies by damaging their economy, by raiding their villages, villagers, or taking, or by taking high tributes. When clan leaders get poor, you will see uh, he will take men from garrisons to reduce payments. Then his settlements will be defenseless. This will end up losing fiefs if he cannot manage things in time. Okay, so it's pretty much saying like this does make sense though, and it kind of gives the player kind of more things that they can do to weaken a uh, a kingdom because obviously. If, if there was no way for um, clans to go broke, then, um, you know what I mean? They would never lose lose garrison numbers. They would never lose food numbers. In that turn, they won't really ever get weaker as they should, right? So I think the biggest problem uh, is currently the game starts imbalanced because of the 1.2 cavalry bonus because they are overpowered and they, all, and they uh, get also tributes. They expand and they also... They will also be uh, economically powerful. I will think something to balance this. Having lots of settlements or for any clan can increase tax corruption. Maybe something like this can make the game more balanced. Income should not increase proportionally by fief count. Okay. Also, Kazates need to be nerfed. I will think something for this. Okay, so the devs agree that Kazates are still going to be nerfed in the future. 
He said income should not be proportional by fief count. Uh, well, I guess he knows probably better than me, right? But um, I don't know exactly what he means by this, but it's kind of vague, but okay. Uh, having lots of settlements for any clan can increase tax corruption. So the more stuff you have, the more corruption. If there was a corruption system, that'd be actually be very cool. Like uh, in terms of like, you know what I mean? Like you can find out if how corrupt someone is or something like that. And, um, or like, it's cause I've been playing like Crusader Kings three. So what they do have is they have secrets, right? And they have a secret, like a person who finds out secrets of other people for you. So you can use it against them or they find out secrets of people planning stuff against you and then you can stop it. Right? So what would be cool is if, um, if Lords and clans can become corrupted and then you can, um, let's say, send one of your companions to check out the situation and see if they could find any corruption. That'd be kind of cool, but that would be probably in the future future. But yeah, there's another episode of uh, this Thread Overlook video where a uh, there's a lot more to come. There's a lot more to come. Like All these pages are just filled. Um, what's it called? The developer in charge of this... Uh, uh, Mexico right here. He he's been working super hard. He's been replying to this thread a lot. So hopefully the information is good. Hopefully you guys enjoy these type of videos. Uh, it will be linked down below. Ask me any questions, any concerns, and like always, stay safe.